Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Skip Podcast, the podcast dedicated to helping you get ahead in your tech career. Uh, I'm your host, Nikhil Singhal, and today's episode, I have invited a good friend of mine named Shreyas Doshi. Many of you may have heard of Shreyas. Shreyas is kind of a guru in the product management community. Uh, you can see his writing on Twitter. Uh, he and I met uh, many years ago as we were both kind of navigating career together, and recently he's focusing on giving back to the product management community and building uh, coursework and uh, really trying to scale up what it means to, to be a successful product manager and a successful product management executive. A few months ago, Shreyas tweeted out a note on how success in academics doesn't actually lead to always success in uh, professional life. I invited Shreyas to talk through career plateaus. What causes professionals to get stuck? What causes them to have success at one phase of career and then get stalled in another? I think that his expertise and his diversity of working in lots of different uh, environments have led to some real insight here. And I think it's very appropriate for a lot of folks that are listening that, that are worried about being stuck or maybe that are feeling a little stuck and not progressing like they used to. So, uh, welcome, Shreyas. Thanks for having me, Nikhil. So, uh, maybe we'll just get right into it. I think that um, one of the things that I was struck by when I was uh, speaking with you is just the density and richness of your, like I always say that careers are made by not one playbook, but having many playbooks so that you can take a, every new challenge is not a page out of a previous playbook, but it's a blend of all these different lessons that one's learned. And you've been at Yahoo and Google, Twitter and Stripe for probably some of the best known and most impactful companies of our generation. And you've been in product management in most of these organizations. And, you know, I just have to sort of say that oftentimes we say product management works like X, but I think in your experience, I suspect that you'll find them that flavored quite differently. Any, any broad guidelines around how these companies might define product management differently? Yeah, perhaps I can start with uh, Stripe, where uh, I joined very early uh, in the, the product management uh, functions uh, kind of life at Stripe. Uh, that was actually one of the things that really excited me uh, about the role at Stripe, uh, uh, which is, hey, here you have an already fairly successful company. So I was talking to them late uh, 2015. And so they already had a you know, few hundred employees at that time. Uh, and uh, they did not famously have product managers, uh, uh, you know, since the early days. And um, uh, they were just starting the product management function. There were a couple of product managers that they had hired, and then they were talking to me. Uh, and uh, I was really excited about this observation of like, here's an already fairly successful company. Uh, and uh, now they are kind of experimenting with product management. That's the best way I could put it. And they were pretty upfront about it, that this was an experiment. And I thought, what a wonderful opportunity uh, to really see if I really believe in product management. I'd been doing product management for 10 plus years already by that time. If I really believe in the value of product management, it, it's, it's such a great opportunity to kind of figure out if product management can add kind of singular value at a company that has already been fairly successful. Uh, so that was why I ended up, um, you know, one of the reasons why I ended up taking the role at Stripe, even though it was unconventional in many different ways. Like I went from being a, you know, a PM leader to going back to IC when I took the Stripe role. So there were lots of kind of strange things that uh, some of my peers, you know, rightly said, hey, are you sure you want to do this? And I was like, no, I want to do this. Uh, and then what happened was, uh, you know, over the next year or two, uh, you know, we were defining, uh, you know, the product managers there and the engineering managers. We were, we were trying to figure out what is the role of product management uh, at Stripe. Uh, and there were actually a few attempts that were made to kind of like write documents of like, this is what product managers do, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, none of that kind of really stuck because even, you know, one and a half, two years in, people were fairly confused. But wait, what, what is it that product management does here? Because uh, it's a very product focused company already. Everybody cares about the product, etc. 
Uh, and so at some point I said, you know what, like, let me take a stab at writing something about what the role of product management is at Stripe. Now that I've been here a couple of years, I kind of have sufficient context. Um, and I ended up writing, uh, if I remember correctly, I ended up writing just three sentences. Uh, and uh, it turned out that that resonated strongly uh, with everybody. Uh, and so for a while, that was the kind of, you know, official kind of role description of product management at Stripe. Uh, and the, if I can share like the first sentence that I shared, and this goes back to my kind of strong conviction of what product management truly is. Uh, what I said, uh, I'm paraphrasing, is the role of a product manager um, is to define what product to build and to orchestrate actions across the organization to make it successful. Okay, so that was the first sentence. And then since this was largely going to be read by like analytical product managers, engineering managers, et cetera, their very next question is going to be, well, how do you define success? So of course I responded to that in the next sentence. So the second sentence was, um, success is defined by uh, user adoption and business value, right? And since then I've extended the definition to customer satisfaction, user adoption uh, and business value. Right. Uh, and so you need to have some of those, if not all of those to say, OK, you know, this is successful. Uh, and uh, that was pretty much it. Right. Like and uh, then I had an FAQ section of, uh, you know, you know, what is the role of an engineering manager in such a product focused company and whatnot. Um, and uh, there was this very important recognition that I wanted to share. And this kind of like, you know, actually goes back to my experiences at these other companies as well, such as Twitter, Google, and Yahoo, uh, where a lot of the confusion and even the friction around the role of product management uh, comes in when uh, people are ex expecting completely mutually exclusive work, which is like, well, that work, that's product manager's job. And that type of work is not the product manager's job. Uh, and what I have observed uh, you know, over the years uh, you know, in terms of sort of how to make product management and the role work is that it needs to be the most adaptive role within a team, right? For instance, uh, and this is something I kind of wrote in the FAQs in that PM role description at Stripe, is there could be situations where uh, you have a product manager and an engineering manager working together or a tech lead uh, working together on some product. Uh, and there could be situations where the engineering manager is uniquely skilled uh, on some user insight, um, maybe because they have experience as a founder in that space or whatever it is, right? So in that case, it is fine for the engineering manager to take on some of the uh, you know, user conversations or to take on some of the go-to-market conversations. Right. Uh, and similarly, there might be cases where a product manager is kind of uniquely technical in a certain area. Uh, and maybe in this situation, the, there is no engineering manager or there's a new engineering manager. It might very well be that the product manager has to adapt again and, and uh, go a little deeper into the technical weeds and technical execution than they ordinarily would do. Right. So, so this, I, this point, I think uh, I only realized this after like 10 plus years of kind of observing product management in many places, but this point is, I think, not clear or to many people. And so people expect like, no, 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 this is the boundaries within which I will work and don't you do anything in here. And you know what, I'm not going to touch these other things because that's your job. And that sort of approach and that trying to put product management as a role in, you know, in a spreadsheet with cells and specific rules doesn't quite work in my opinion. Um, so, so that's my overall kind of perspective on from what I've seen at these various companies and what I've seen works with, you know, good product management. Yeah, maybe another w w framing that I use is gaps in glue. I think that you, oftentimes we're the glue function. You know, everyone has the boxes in their org chart and the lines in between the boxes often come into product management. And I think your insight is that sometimes people own some of those lines. They have leadership around collaboration or they own customer relationships or they may have expertise. 
and the art of product management is to sort of adapt and 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 pull back when needed and lean in when 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 needed as well and it sounds like what you're telling me is the the way you're defining product management sort of applied across these different companies that was sort of a consistent theme that you saw in the function curious around are there areas that these companies did define product management very differently maybe because of the industry or the culture or perhaps the scale of the product i think the big differences i noticed were inseparable from uh, the culture of those companies and there were many big differences in the manner in which product management worked and uh, product managers operated uh, and uh, so some interesting factors were um, say you know when i joined google this was uh, i think 2008 product management had been around at google for a while by then Uh, but um, there was still this view that hey we are in much more engineering we are an engineering company and your role as a product manager is to support engineering in fact back then you know depending on which part of the or google org you were in uh, it was often said that like everybody is just here to support engineering and that's your role um, and uh, you know that meant a very different way of approaching you know the product manager's work uh, versus say uh, twitter which was uh, a lot uh, uh, you know a lot more pm driven right it was uh, it was you know it was expected that pms for whatever reason the culture was such that like pms are going to drive everything Uh, and it, sometimes it almost felt like some of the other functions there was lots of friction sometimes between pm and other functions because it, it was expected that like pm is the driver and everybody else is kind of the supporting function um and th- that caused its own set of problems because uh, you know that's kind of like in my opinion that's not how you go about building product i saw you know something similar at yahoo as well uh, now i joined yahoo you know during its better days but still like you know it was like around 2006 or so so again product management had been around for a while and there i saw it was even very stark where you know that part i said where product manager's job is to define the product to be built uh, well at yahoo there were cases where uh, you know some engineering teams would not build what it would seems like an obvious kind of uh, f- you know uh, feature or error message or something because it wasn't in the spec Uh, and so you would have these conversations with folks of like yeah it wasn't in the prd but it's obvious that when the user encounters this error we need an error message and the response used to be well but the product manager should have defined it right uh, and so there wasn't that kind of agency and that uh, you know uh, user centric view that many other functions had <clears throat> and stripe i think was the most interesting because um, you know at stripe uh, what ended up happening is that uh being customer centric was just a core value that was applied across all functions um and being user centric and even being product centric was applied across all functions uh and so over there i found that my job as a product manager was uh the easiest in a way because i did not have to like convince people um that oh you know the product is not good enough we need to make it better in fact i would hear that from engineers uh, they would say you know what no 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 i need like two more days because i feel like this interaction is not uh, you know well thought out or these uh, this documentation is not great and we need to make it great uh, and so uh, so that was really uh, fun for me as somebody who wants to build really excellent products that the entire fabric of the organization and because of the culture and it started with the founders the entire fabric of the organization was kind of you know pushing and like moving you towards building uh, you know the best possible product that you can for your customers uh, and and so i think a lot of these differences in the manner in which product management works uh, are 
very deeply rooted in uh, the culture itself of the company because again product management is such a you know broad function that works with so many other functions that um, you know both the features and the bugs that come up are often just features and bugs of the culture itself mm, i love that that's such a great statement and i think that with your depth of experience and diversity of experience in this important function product management you know, I think you have so much to offer others. One of the conversations we've been having over the last half a dozen years is how do you scale yourself and your knowledge? You know, how do you give back? Um, and and there's only so many roles that you can have full time. And I think that you know, looking even at your LinkedIn, there's probably now I don't know maybe a half dozen to a dozen formal advisory roles that you've taken on. And and I think that a lot of our listeners that are in this sort of act two of career where they're leaders, they've had a lot of success, they, you know, want to do more than maybe their day job. They're asking this question around, you know, I, I probably have knowledge that others would use. I, I'd love to be an advisor. But how does one go about doing that? How do, what kind of what kind of talent are they looking for? Companies, why would they need me? How do I plug in? You know, all these questions. And I'm sure you faced those questions a half dozen years ago. You know, how did you plug in to becoming an advisor? And what's that relationship like? And why has that been an investment for you? Yeah, it's been such a such a fun journey for me in this kind of uh, this chapter of my career, where uh, I have at this point. Uh, you know, advised, meaningfully advised more than a hundred companies. A lot of, most of the advising work I do is uh, informal advising. Um, and, and then there are some kind of formal advising arrangements that I also have where I work with uh, founders on a longer term basis, whether it's six months, 12 months, or even longer sometimes. And um, a couple of uh, observations from my own journey um, you know, I started uh, getting this. I did not plan for this necessarily, uh, but I started getting into this because, uh, you know, while I was at Stripe, there were companies reaching out to me for, you know, leadership opportunities as they do, I'm sure, to, uh, you know, many of your listeners as well. Uh, and, you know, for whatever reason, if the timing wasn't right, um, uh, you know, my the previous mode I took earlier in my career was just to say, well, the timing isn't right. So, you know, let's talk again later. Uh, but by this time, I felt like I had uh, both enough context and interest uh, to still engage in a conversation with the founder. Not so much about, not in the interview kind of setting, but more in the setting of like, uh, okay, so, you know, you presumably reached out to me because you heard good things from somebody else. Uh, I am not looking for an operating role right now, but um, if you want to chat, I'm happy to chat and I'm happy to, you know, uh, provide my perspective on whatever it is that you're trying to do. So that's really how it started. And I had, I don't know, dozens of such conversations uh, over my last, uh, you know, two or three years at Stripe. Uh, and, and frankly, these things don't even take that much time because like on average, it's just like one conversation a month or something like that. So like anybody can manage that. And the interesting, that, uh, interesting thing that happened, Nikhil, is um, uh, I'll share like what happened at my end and then uh, at the founder's end. So at my end, like, again, I had not planned any of this, so uh, I didn't know what to expect. Uh, but I found myself extremely invigorated at the end of those conversations. And by the way, these were like intense conversations because like, you know, there's a very important problem or problems that the founder is kind of sharing with me. Uh, and, uh, you know, usually even if we had one hour, we'd go one and a half hours, sometimes two hours. Um, and, and even at the end of it, I felt like, like a lot of energy. <laughs> so I noticed that and said, okay, that's interesting. Then on the other side, sometimes I would ask the founder. So like, was this useful? Uh, we just went through, often it was the topic used to be like, well, I'm looking, my VCs are telling me that I need a head of product, a CPO, VP product, whatever. Uh, what should I do? And that's, that's why they reached out to me to kind of like try to hire me. Um, and so I say, like, I kind of like 
hear them out, hear out what they're trying to do, the strategy, the challenges, etc., their own kind of skills uh, and uh, their own kind of superpowers. Uh, and then I would share my perspective um, on things. Um, and so after that, I would ask them, like, so was this useful? Uh, and oftentimes I heard some version of the following. I heard something like, well, you know, you were one of the four or five people uh, that, uh, you know, I reached out to, uh, to kind of, or talk to, to understand this issue. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, four of them said the same thing, right? Uh, and what you said, you were the fifth one, and you, what you said was something entirely different. Um, and your perspective resonated. So I'm going to try it out. Because sometimes, say if it's the problem of, it was not always the case, but so, say it's the problem of, okay, I want to hire a head of product, right? Uh, the first question they ask is like, what should I look for and who do you know, right? And so I would often tell them like, that's the wrong place to start, right? It's like, what are you really trying to do, et cetera? Like, you know, you'd go through that kind of like, you know, intense inquiry of like, what are we trying to really do here? Uh, so as so that we can set this person up for success. And sometimes the conclusion that the founder would reach is actually I should not be hiring a CPO right now. You know, I should go hire a kind of like, a, you know, um, a mid-level experience PM uh, and I should continue to do a lot of the product work uh, and I should delegate certain aspects. So that kind of, this is a very important decision, right? Like, and so like helping founders through this decision uh, which like, again, like my job is not to tell them what to do. My job is to help them figure out what the right thing is to do for them. Uh, I heard often enough that like, oh, you know, your perspective was different and it resonated. And so that's when I started thinking, well, if I am deriving so much energy from this and if my perspective is uniquely useful, then maybe there's something here, right? So that's, that was kind of like the genesis of this. Uh, and then over time, I just, you know, I was just, I, I kept, and when I, after I left Stripe, I kept myself open to, yes, if, you know, I, I'm happy to talk to energetic, smart, talented founders uh, with no kind of expectation of any kind of formal advisory relationship. Um, and sometimes I would get on one or two calls, sometimes three calls with them. And in some of those cases, they would say, you know what, I want to continue this. I want to continue this. Uh, and that's how, you know, some of my formal advisory work started was merely as a result of founders wanting to continue that. And uh, my desire to want to continue working with the founder because I thought they were great. That's so helpful. There's so many nuggets in there. I mean, what I'm hearing is there was always opportunities because you're always getting unsolicited inbound. And so you started paying attention to that. And when you have those early conversations, you observe two things. One was how, what was your energy levels after the conversation concluded? And you noticed that this was something that excited you, which then meant you were naturally gravitated to prioritize and invest more. And then the second is you got good feedback that you were saying something that you were clearly authentic and passionate about and you had insight that others had had really valued. And the combination was enough to lean in, but you didn't start with I this 2023, I want five advisory roles and I'm going to run a process to find those. You simply said, can I help companies and enjoy it along the way? And if one thing led to another and the company started to attach, there was naturally some organic relationship that would follow because you wouldn't want it to stop on either side. But if it turned out that after a couple of conversations, it was enough that you either didn't have enough follow through or you would solve the tactical problem, well, then it wouldn't make sense to be an advisor anyway and you part as friends and perhaps that leads to another future advisory role. And so that looseness approach, but opening yourself up to opportunity is what I'm hearing. And I think it's great advice for folks that do find themselves this year, maybe being a bit more constrained in their day job, maybe because the role has shrunk or the company's not growing as much, but there's so much activity in the industry and there's so much inbound. Take advantage of that to see if you can spark some desire and find some unique insights. So I, I, I really love that point. 
I also noticed that I just got better as I had these conversations, right? Like, you know, the first 10 advisory conversations I had, uh, you know, I wasn't as effective and as useful as the last 10 I've had. And that this kind of seems obvious, of, you know, because you, if you do something long enough, you'd improve. But my point is that perhaps... You know, early on, I wasn't quite yet even ready to kind of like start an advising business, right? Like I just noticed the quality of questions I ask now is so much better than the quality of questions I used to ask, uh, you know, the first 10 or 20 or 50 times I did it. Uh, and ultimately, you know, as an advisor, uh, there is insight, obviously, and I share insight. But the greatest value I can add is through the questions I ask you. And I will now often ask you just like three to four questions. And in many cases, it like just the questions and the prompts and the follow-up questions and that discussion, you as a founder will end up with an like, and I've heard this often, um, you know, that like, oh, I've been working on this for three or four years. I spent an hour with you and I ended up with a completely different perspective on this thing I've been working on for the last three, four years. And I look back and say like, hey, what did I do? Like, I actually didn't do much other than just ask you the right three, four, five, six questions uh, and prompted you and nudged you. And then you reached the, the whatever conclusion that you were looking for on your own, right? Like I did, like, I don't know about 50 different domains that I can give you a domain specific ex expertise. Uh, it's for you to figure that out, but it's the quality of the questions. And so I, I do think it's important to understand that if we start approaching something from a, like, I want to, you know, start a business or I want to start a practice here, um, we might actually lose out on that kind of like necessary, uh, you know, early stage uh, experience that we need such that we can actually build a, a very sustainable and a differentiated practice in these areas. And I think those questions are one of your many superpowers. And I think I would say concise wisdom is maybe another way. And you truly have embodied uh, art when I look at your Twitter uh, content because I've always struggled with communicating the concepts and the frameworks that I've been building around leadership or career or product management into short form content. And you've managed to do it in that 140 characters. I think that uh, for those of you that are listening that aren't following Shreyas on his Twitter feed, you're really missing out because you get these questions, you get these insights, you get these clear uh, where he's different from the the tribe, the, those those insights have been incredibly helpful to me to just sometimes just have vocabulary to frame something that's sort of ruminating, but to have the words and to name it is so powerful. And the combination of that and your small group super follower community, I think, has been really insightful. But I think you're mm -hmm. onto something new lately, is what I understand. You're, you're. I think maybe you're, you, you're a teacher by trade, but you've been scaling up not only your content but your, your teaching. And I, I don't know much about it, but I read these highest ROI that I've ever spent on a weekend, accelerated my product management career. So tell me a little bit more about what you've been up to and, and are, are you effectively now teaching a course or how does that work? Yeah, that's been um, a really fun experience. And I just started doing this about four or four or five months ago. Um, and the way it started uh, is uh, as I was kind of, you know, after I let, left Stripe, this was in May 2021, um, uh, I decided for the first time in my career to take some time to figure out what's next. I talked to a lot of uh, people. Uh, I think I, you and I spoke as well about sort of like what's next and how to think about all of that. Uh, and I had just kept an open mind that like, oh, you know, I'm going to start writing a little more because now I have more time and I have now a followership on Twitter and LinkedIn. Uh, and then I was, I'm going to continue doing more of my advising work, uh, you know, which kind of again started while I was still at Stripe. Uh, so I'm going to start, uh, you know, doing more of those things. Uh, and as those started working very well and gave me tremendous satisfaction, one of the 
one of the things I noticed is there was something missing. So like my advising work was covering for the one-on-one deep uh, impact uh, uh, really well, right? Like whether it's like with one founder or a couple of founders or with executives at the company, uh, that was just deeply satisfying. It was like going deep and having context uh, over a long period of time and um, uh, a high degree of impact to one company, uh, whichever one I'm advising right now. Okay, so that was taken care of, the one-on-one. Then I had the writing, uh, which by that time was now reaching hundreds of thousands of people. Um, so, so I had the one to hundreds of thousands also covered. Now over there, obviously, um, you know, the impact is not going to be as deep with all the hundred thousand plus uh, people, uh, but it's going to be very broad. Uh, and I started sensing that there was something missing, which was... Um, you know, what about the one is to 100 and one is to 1000 impact? And the way it kind of manifested was I was getting a lot of requests for coaching. Uh, And I did not want to kind of start a conventional coaching practice uh, because I was already doing the deep advising work. uh, And I felt like, you know, if I also start doing coaching, then, you know, I'm just not going to be as effective with the deep kind of strategy, go to market culture advising that I do with startups. So, uh, so that's when the idea of courses uh, came about, which is what if I can uh, do coaching, uh, but through courses, right? Uh, And uh, and so the manner in which now I've structured, I have one course out right now, which is about managing your product career, uh, where I'm sharing sort of, you know, 20 plus years of my own learning, but also uh, learnings from people I know. Um, and uh, also I interview, uh, you know, product leaders and, uh, you know, executive recruiters. You and I had a conversation about that as well for my course. Um, and I kind of like, pack all of those insights into uh, a weekend uh, that is focused uh, on sort of the end-to-end view of your career, right from, you know, what sort of path do you want to create? uh, How do you build competence uh, to how do you find the right companies? Because it's so important, like a lot of our career is like really dependent on, you know, identifying the right company, how to get hired, uh, how to negotiate a, a comp and like how to evaluate offers. That's another area where I've seen people make so many mistakes uh, where you did everything right up to this point. But now, you know, you had three offers and you ended up picking the wrong one, right? Like in hindsight, the wrong one. So is there a way to figure out like which is the right offer for you in a way that you minimize mistakes uh, to sort of like how do you then get recognition within your company? How do you grow within your company? How do you get promoted how do you sort of, you know, plan for the right kind of ratings for your work, that sort of stuff. Uh, and then most recently, I also added a section around how to deal with the tech jobs downturn that we are kind of starting to see here. Um, so anyway, so, uh, you know, I've crafted that uh, 800 people uh, have already kind of gone through this. And uh, what I realized is my hypothesis was that uh, if I structure this in a unique way, and if I treat this course like I would treat a product and kind of basically just like product manage it uh, such that I can have the right kind of effect on my users, in this case, my students, um, then that would be a, you know, wonderful kind of experience and hopefully useful for students. Uh, And that hypothesis, I would say, has been proven at this point because, um, you know, a lot of people have told me that like it just substantially changed the way they have, they were thinking about their career. Uh, you know, they were just thinking kind of one track. Now they understand that for them, there are actually various different tracks possible. We go through a lot of exercises along the way as well uh, for people to figure some of that out. And then there's a community and various other resources available. Um, so, uh, yeah, all in all, I'm super excited because now I'm able to fill this kind of one to 100 and one to 1000 gap. Uh, and kind of effectively what I'm trying to do, Nikhil, is not not necessarily teach a course, but coach a course, right? Like uh, it should feel like you are actually getting coaching from me because I just cannot scale to one-on-one coaching or even one, two, three coaching anymore. Uh, and so as part of that, I have these extensive AMA sessions where I'll kind of answer your questions and so on. Uh, and then lastly, people who take my course, I want them to continue learning 
after they're done with the course as well. I don't just want it to be like, oh, that was a fun weekend. I learned a lot of new things, new frameworks, met a bunch of people. Now I'm just going to go back to doing what I was doing. Uh, to solve that problem, I've just recently, last week, launched uh, something called Product Club. Uh, and so uh, people who take my course are eligible to uh, join Product Club where they have an ongoing channel with me. There's a dedicated Slack of everybody who took my course. So now it's already uh, 400 plus people who have joined Product Club and are on this Slack. Uh, and over there, uh, I will be doing uh, monthly events with them where again, it's kind of this AMA style. I'll share what's top of mind. And kind of again, like in the spirit of coaching and group coaching, kind of create a channel where I can uh, reach you and I can address, you know, the questions and the challenges you're facing right now, not just, you know, a month ago when you took my course. So I'm super excited about that. And now spending, you know, a pretty large amount of my time just focused on this. Well, it's so appropriate for the listeners because many, many of these listeners are thinking through their tech careers. And a lot of the questions you asked around decisions, compensation, thinking long-term, understanding how to navigate internal and external climates and downturns are all kind of dead on. And so for those of you that 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 are thinking through, you know, those questions, you know, burning a weekend to listen and learn from not only Shreyas, but from others that are going through the same problem, I think is 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 a tremendous value add. And what's also exciting to me, Shreyas, is to hear that that's one that's only one class that you have in mind, that there's others potentially coming and that there may be more more ways to sort of scale and product manage your wisdom, which which I think is a great great way to frame it. You know, along those lines and along this sort of maybe pivoting a little bit to a tweet that caught my eye in July that had you know a lot of the characteristics of this ability to very concisely put language around something that i had been observing for decades you know and for decades you know looking at people that have had tremendous success and strength in academics you know you and i both are surrounded with folks in our industry who you know were at the top of their class from a prestigious university or set of universities and had all the makings of just, you know, success in every way, shape or form. And what you find is they don't necessarily struggle on a consistent basis, but they're just inconsistent. There's almost no connection with their success uh, 15 years later and their academic success. Some did incredibly well. Some never found their footing and some were in between. And similarly, if you look at some of the most successful entrepreneurs, executives, and leaders, and those that have elite careers, many of them didn't have tremendous academic backgrounds. And so I've always kind of ruminated on this, especially as you talk to parents who have kids that are so dedicated to trying to get their son or their daughter, you know, the best education, the best school and that whole kind of rigmarole. And you start thinking through, well, is this really that connected? And I think you wrote this, this really powerful statement, which is what we learn in school must be unlearned in business and in life. And I just, I thought that was so powerful. And I, I'd love to just get your perspective. Maybe what, what possessed you to, to write this note? And maybe we can go through some of the areas, uh, you know, in this discussion. But where did this come from? Yeah, quite similar to you, Nikhil. I uh, had been working with, uh, you know, highly accomplished, brilliant, brilliant people um, with wonderful, wonderful resumes uh, in some cases. Uh, you know, as peers, in other cases, as, you know, managers, and in other cases, as, uh, you know, people who were on my team. Uh, and I started noticing and kind of asked myself the question of like, well, here you have somebody who just clearly has all the talent uh, that you need to be highly successful in whatever it is that they're doing. And yet, the impact isn't there. Uh, and not only that, uh, and this was especially true in cases where I was coaching, mentoring, or managing somebody, because uh, we would have you know, deep conversations about this stuff. Um, 
and yet uh, you know both the impact isn't sort of in proportion to the talent and the potential but also they were just deeply frustrated uh, with how things were going and uh, and they couldn't quite figure out why uh, things were not going the way they wanted uh, them to go so that was that I, I saw that often enough across companies and across teams and what not uh, and i started thinking about why this might be occurring so consistently um and that's when i realized that a lot of no not entirely but a lot of um why that is happening is because uh the the things that you learn you know in your formative years um they work really well for you uh, in those years in the academic context uh and then you know as many of us do we then tell ourselves a story that like if i do x i get y right and then we bring that story into the workplace and actually early on perhaps at junior levels it does work right <laughs> at entry level uh it does work right because you have a boss and they will tell you like you need to do this and you go do that and uh and it's very structured and and you're given all the right resources uh there is no ambiguity uh and it works and so you say wow okay this works so let me do more of it right and then the organization recognizes you uh, and now you are at the next level or the level after that and then all of a sudden it stops working and that's what causes that frustration which is like by this time now i've had you know whatever 15 years 18 years of a certain approach that has worked wonderfully well for me look at my resume and now it's not working right and often times uh, what would happen nikhil is uh, the first blame would go to the environment which is like oh this organization or this company you know it's screwed up in all sorts of different ways and if only we could align and create the right kind of optimal environment uh, then you will see how much impact i can have right and so so you know and i've done so many deep kind of coaching conversations with folks on my team and others on this topic and that's what kind of led me to uh, you know write this uh, piece about the things we learn early on that work for us that then sometimes we have to unlearn later on this sort of career plateauing or frustration coming up in mid career i think is what really connected me to the to the material i think concretely you mentioned that you know when you're in school you need to be good at following rules and following structures and yet in business breaking rules leads to outsized returns and you're often expected to create your own structure and we've talked about on this uh podcast how oftentimes managers are actually quite weak at creating the structure and letting you color within the lines particularly as you become a leader and feedback is extremely clear in school you get tests and grades and the goals are very obvious you get graduation and you get to the next level but in business feedback is actually quite rare and good feedback in particular and that there's such small differences between winning and losing it's not so concrete of a versus b versus c and timelines are often very short they're uh, measured in a quarter or a semester or a year and then there's a clear end date you know i'm going to graduate at the end of this year go to school college but careers are you know 20 jobs 15 jobs 12 jobs for many people and the best rewards often take many 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 years where you see all these examples of we worked for 6 7 years before we found you know confidence or skill or or product market fit so things are relatively short lived so these are the things when it you know comes to these structural rules would would you say that now when you apply it to managers that might be in this mode where they're feeling stuck are they struggling with this and maybe a, a a better way to ask the question is what is your coaching advice for folks that are in this sort of rule feedback 
timeline. It wasn't in the PRD, so I'm not going to do it. So they're very much sticking to the lines. But we both know that leadership is often breaking lines, creating your own. How do you coax someone to see that and change that behavior? The general theme I see often is um, this idea of, um, you know, well, I need, uh, so this is like a, you know, a leader, um, whether it's a, you know, first level manager or perhaps even uh, you know, director, VP level person um, who says, well, I can, I'm responsible for this goal or I'm responsible for this metric or whatever. Uh, and the challenge is that, uh, you know, the rest of the organization, there isn't clarity, isn't, there isn't clarity on how this fits in. Uh, there isn't clarity uh, on you know just how much of a priority this is, etc. Um, and and that often is uh, a theme that uh, you know I have um, dealt with as a manager or in some cases as I was coaching folks. Um, and my approach is to help them realize through a series of questions that effectively this is why you have this role right, is like, you know, your number one job is to create clarity in an environment that is extremely noisy, is extremely complex, and is by definition ambiguous, right? So, so your job shifts from, you know, just kind of uh, through sheer will and sheer discipline, just getting things done, because that's what you gets you promoted early on. That's what gets you good grades, right? Like there's a rubric, uh, you know, the, the teacher or the professor publishes the rubric and then you follow the rubric uh, and voila, you know, you get the A grade. Um, and that transition that, uh, you know, the folks who are kind of sometimes feeling stuck uh, that they need to go through is that, oh, now it is my job to create that clarity, right? Like, and there is never going to be an environment, uh, you know, from this point forward, uh, if I'm going to be operating at these levels, where the clarity is ready-made, right? Uh, and so, so then once they realize it, and look, I cannot tell you that directly, because if I tell you that, it's not going to work. You have to realize it yourself. And that requires, you know, a series of questions, uh, introspection and all of that. But once you reach that point, now we are having a very different conversation, right? We are having the conversation of, okay, so, so now how much, uh, you know, how much responsibility are you going to take to tell uh, the CEO that this is what needs to happen, right? Uh, how much responsibility are you going to take to tell your cross-functional peers uh, that here's where we are headed? Uh, and and then, then we can start talking about, okay, now how do you communicate it? What are the tactics and the techniques and the process that you use to communicate all of this uh, across your organization? in a way that uh, the efforts are cohesive uh, and, and people are motivated and all of that, right? Uh, and so oftentimes, you know, people kind of jump directly to this, uh, which is like oftentimes, you know, a lot of times what happens is people, people encounter a problem and they jump directly to how do I do this, right? Um, whereas like uh, sometimes I have to help them understand like first let's understand what is your role and what it is that even needs to be done and when we can figure that out and it's the correct thing, the how actually writes itself. And I can help you with that. But, you know, the, we can get to the how, but we first need to understand what your role is in all of this. And folks who cannot make this transition, uh, they kind of feel stuck in their careers. And oftentimes, uh, you know, the executive team, uh, the CEO, is also frustrated that here you have somebody with great potential uh, but they are not quite, you know, creating the clarity I need. Uh, they're not quite creating the clarity for their area uh, that uh, will move things forward. Uh, and, uh, you know, I also see this tendency, Nikhil, sometimes in folks who've kind of spent a lot of time in, um, 
you know, very large companies. Because in very large companies, even if you are at kind of senior director level and whatnot, sometimes uh, you are handed a, a sort of like, you know, a recipe, a roadmap and a specific set of things to do. If you've been doing that for many, many years uh, and now you're going to a startup, uh, you're now all of a sudden going to be confused because there isn't that, you know, clear charter uh, that you've been given. Uh, and I saw this quite a bit, uh, you know, at Stripe and also in places, uh, you know, where I've kind of advised executives who've gone to startups from large company environments, where they often felt like, well, but we don't know, like, you know, hey, it's so screwed up, like, the, we don't have a clear strategy, or we don't have, uh, you know, there's all this kind of open questions that are not answered. And then I have to help them understand, yeah, it's your job to uh, create that clarity to help answer those questions such that you can have that cohesive execution. The things that come to mind when I hear you describe this is mindset and courage. And what I mean by that is those that succeed in coming to the conclusion that you pose through questions that, hey, what got me here isn't necessarily what gets me there. I need to unlearn maybe the things that I would even suggest are my superpowers or my professional identity, or in maybe in the case of school, my academic identity. And I need to come in with a beginner's mindset that there must be maybe a different way of solving the problem that I'm not a victim to the ambiguity, but that I own the ambiguity. It becomes my problem, not the environment or the company or the CEO or the management team's problem. I am part of it. But I think that even having said that, that's a lot of energy. That is not an easy task. There's a reason why people don't take on more responsibility or go from these late stage to early stage environment. Because it does take courage. You know, it takes this uh, interest in starting again and going through the process of relearning and maybe even unlearning. And I'm curious as to how you think about this mindset and shift and this energy and courage required. Would you agree that that's important? And perhaps how do you ensure that people have it when they're faced with this challenge? I like uh, the characterization of a lot of these attributes in terms of uh, uh, this term I encountered, I think Eric Weinstein uh, uh, coined it called a high agency. Uh, and it is essentially the idea that like some people are just kind of high agency people uh, and they just take on problems they, with full ownership. Uh, and they furthermore apply a high degree of creativity to solving the, those problems. Uh, and along the way, they show a high degree of resilience and confidence um, as they encounter challenges uh, which are inevitable uh, in complex, you know, uh, high stakes environments. Uh, and so that combination of, uh, you know, resilience and confidence and ownership mindset and uh, the creativity, and then lastly, influential communication. So those five things, when we put together, you get this, you know, idea of high agency. Um, and I think that is, again, one of the key things I've noticed that, um, you know, once you go from, you know, doing a job really well to needing to lead a job uh, that needs to be done well to needing to lead uh, many, many jobs that need to be done really well, that high agency is the big differentiator between sort of like, you know, good and ordinary and good careers and really great careers and great impact. Um, 
and i do believe that uh, this is something that uh, can be cultivated um, you know now any kind of world class levels of any of these things a lot of it is kind of you know inborn like sort of traits etc but just because you know uh, certain things like some people are just naturally great communicators right like they did not have to do much it seems effortless right but just because somebody is a 10 out of 10 communicator just because they have some natural gifts uh, that doesn't mean if i am a 6 that i shouldn't strive to be a 7 8 or a 9 right uh, and and so so i do think that kind of uh, that that's where some of that mindset comes in as well which is like uh, look often times um, you know i i share some of this in my course as well uh, that you know one of my observations is that often times especially as kind of you know leaders most of our problems are actually in many ways messaging problems right uh, and, and because we need to be able to we know what the right thing is uh, and however we got to that conclusion we know what the right thing is but there are so many challenges along the way to kind of message it in a way that resonates with everybody that aligns everybody that excites everybody right so it's a messaging problem so 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 how do you deal with it right like if you're just focused on the content if you told yourself the story of like no 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 just the content everybody should figure this out on their own like why like why can't they figure this out like are they idiots right like i, I see a lot of that kind of you know uh, approach and you know thought processes uh, and and what you have to unlearn here is um no look like this is where you need to exercise the skill of influential communication which again one of the attributes of high agency uh, and you know if a message doesn't resonate one way you got to try it another way and in fact you know at higher levels your job is to just be a repeater right like you're just repeating the same thing over and over again in different ways such that it will resonate with people um and And, and you know like for instance one like very tactical example i'll use is some leaders will say you know oh i like sending written updates right so i will send emails and i expect the team to kind of you know i'll put my thoughts in i'll put a lot of care into it and and uh, i expect the team to read it and kind of understand i have a large org so i expect them to understand what needs to happen uh, and then it should happen right well it turns out if you kind of just think a little critically about this say you have an organization of uh, 1000 people 500 people even 100 people or even 30 people it turns out uh, that some people naturally uh, resonate with the written word format right they love they devour your emails or your google docs or whatever uh, and uh, and it works for them and they get the message at the same time there are some other people for whom this kind of verbal communication is the thing that's going to resonate right so you'll have to go up there and this is something i had to learn as a leader as well that you have to go up there uh, and at all hands or team meetings or whatever you need to make appearance in every single team meeting within your org and talk about this because that's what they are going to really resonate with uh while the email people are like well this meeting could have been an email <laughs> right uh and and then in some cases uh some people are highly visual and so if there is a vision you want to convey you might even have to create some you know inspiring prototypes and inspiring mockups you know and even though it's very early stage you might even have to do that because the words you know for some people just reading the words is not enough right like they need to see how it's going to manifest and the the moment they see that manifestation they are like aha now i get it right i did not get the email i did not get the google doc i did not even get the all hands where we talked about this but i got the marks right or i got the customer story right so so this is an example of something where i find that like people need to kind of you know change the mindset of like now it's no longer about you know what medium you prefer or what is your superpower it's about figuring out what works for your organization uh, and then influentially communicating uh, in variety of different ways so this is just one example but this is the kind of thing um, that uh, takes some leaders a really long time to sort of like you know come to terms with
It's that last thing that I think is probably the other piece that I'd want us to emphasize for those listeners that are feeling like they're plateauing. They're hearing Shreyas talk about you need to take a bit of a step backward, assess the needs of the organization, take some agency, take some ownership, and then re- rethink your style, rethink your approach. The fact is that these things take time. They are not going to happen overnight. And why that's an important statement is in the past, you might have been promoted every year. You might have been a straight A student. You might have found things come easy because the way that you think is the same way that others expect. But now your organization's larger. The tools need to be more diverse. You have to own the ambiguity as opposed to be shielded from it. And so it's not unusual for I, for me to see people who have had very fast starts to careers, quote unquote, hit a bit of a wall when they get to management, when they get to even executive. And that hit the wall might be them just working through the pain of relearning themselves, relearning their technique. And then they unstick and then they start moving quickly forward. And so you have to have that courage, that patience, and that optimism that you maybe are a six today, but when you're an eight, you, things will unlock. But I think if your mindset is that this, I must be doing something wrong because I, or the environment must be wrong because I was moving so quick in the past, perhaps it's exactly the opposite. So, Shreyas, as we conclude, I'd love to just maybe get a a last few words from you on any additional advice you have for those that are listening that really feel like they're stuck a bit and that they're hearing your words, they're understanding they need to go through this, but any beyond maybe taking your class, any other ideas that might help them as they approach this sort of unsticking themselves from this sort of spot they're in? The main thing I I would suggest uh, that folks consider is that there are many more options available to you than meets the eye. Uh, Because I think uh, we we do have, I see especially in highly high talent, fast-paced organizations, which naturally then like sort of, you know, there are many ambitious people in these companies. Um, and a lot of times, Nikhil, I see, um, people are just focused on the conventional path, which is like, okay, I'm at L8. The next is L9. And, uh, the one after that, uh, is going to take me two more years or three more years. And that is a viable path for sure. Uh, but uh, it is not for everybody. Uh, and I think people, there is this kind of some almost stigma around, um, you know, oh, if you are ambitious, but if you are not VP by this time, that means, you know, something's wrong with you or you failed or whatever. Um and it turns out that like that's why there are many people who reach the VP stage or the CPO stage and they kind of hate it because that was not the authentic path for them, right? Uh, or maybe they should have explored a few other things before, uh, you know, they, they tried to go for the CPO role or whatever that is. And so I think a lot of people just kind of miss that. And it's almost, it's sometimes I feel like it's, it's like, uh, you know, a video game, which is like, okay, the point of a video game is to get to the next level. Uh, and if I do these things, I get to the next level, but it's kind of like, you need to understand what awaits you at that next level. Uh, you need to understand if, um, you know, you have the right skill set. uh, you know, just because, you know, just because the next level exists, uh, doesn't mean that that has to be your only goal. Uh, even if, say, you have the right skill set, uh, maybe it's not the right time in your life, right? Uh, and uh, maybe it's, 
you know maybe maybe you would find more fulfillment uh in just staying at the level you are for the next 3 4 years but trying different things right developing different skills um so 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 that's just like one aspect of the general point that uh, i like uh, folks to really think hard about is like just you know be rigorous about your career decisions and as product people uh, you know many of us pride ourselves on uh, you know making really great uh, product decisions whether that's um, we are marrying data with anecdotes etc but we pride ourselves in making really great product decisions well like you, we should be applying uh, that same degree of rigor that same degree of thoughtfulness to the most to what i would argue is the most important product which is ourselves right uh, and and you know i'll share a concrete example sometimes for instance here's how this manifests where you know folks feel like they have the right idea but they don't and then they make inauthentic choices so often times i'll talk to somebody who's super ambitious say they are at a big tech company like google or something else uh, and you know they 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 want to figure out what ne- what's next for your career uh naturally the topic uh, sometimes the topic uh, that they bring up is like well actually you know 3 years from now 4 years from now or a couple of years few years from now i expect to that i i should be founding a company uh, i want to do a venture back startup that's something i've always dreamed of uh, and i i think i'm going to be ready life wise etc to do that couple of years from now okay great uh so then we start talking about okay what's next and so then they say okay in order to do that the next thing i need to do is i need to uh you know become vp okay and so i ask them like okay help me understand you know what your rationale is and it often boils down to like two things uh one of two things uh one is oh is that way i'll manage larger scope i'll know how to manage uh, i'll i'll maybe own pnl i'll know how to manage the company manage people manage organizations and that's a useful skill obviously as a founder uh so that's one version i hear and the other version i hear is oh it it might give me more credibility with vcs and whatever else that's roughly the two reasons i hear and then like i have to point out that like you know your number one job as a founder of an early stage venture back startup is not to manage an org right it's to build a product that resonates highly such that you reach this kind of product market fit right because without that your org building skills or your org management skills are kind of useless right and let's face the reality that most startups never make it to that point right so just logically if we were to really deeply logically think about this and like rationally do it without putting emotion into it and without having kind of linkedin envy uh like just if we look at it rationally it makes more sense for you for over the next two years to figure out what skills you need to develop what product skills you need to develop right uh, what design skills you need to develop or what domain skills you need to develop such that you maximize the odds that your startup hits product market fit right nothing else matters until then and if there are gaps there let's go fill that gap right and that might actually mean not going for that vp promotion because as a vp you're not going to get to exercise a lot of these skills that we are talking about because there are other people in your team that are going to be doing that right it might even make sense depending on your situation that you go back to an ic role right for an early stage kind of initiative that you take forward uh, or it might even mean something else where you take a role which is not all that time consuming so that you can kind of incubate your new venture um, you know on weekends or in uh, in evenings uh, as you kind of embark on this right so again there is no one right answer for everybody but this is an example where i think most people assume that like oh this thing is the right answer for me but uh, you know we've just got to think critically about it and we've got to like my i would encourage you to kind of a lot of these things happen because the ego comes into play right like we want that vp title and then we rationalize that desire with through some logical explanation 
And so we we really have to kind of like, you know, uh, look at that a little more closely uh, and uh, objectively. Uh, and, you know, the ego is there, but like try to at least, you know, see that the ego is playing a role here. Have the courage to find your own path. Recognize that the path that a company's laid out isn't necessarily the career path for you. And, and I think embrace the opposite of conventional wisdom, whether it's strength and academics don't lead to professional success or getting that VP may be the exact opposite thing to become a great founder or perhaps even to drive fulfillment and career maximization. And I think that a lot of the courage is to find your own path, to reinvent oneself, to take that step backwards and, and have that beginner mindset for your own career, which is you know, ultimately your most important product. So, Treyas, thank you for joining me today. Uh, for those people that are listening that want to get in touch with you, what's the best way to do that? We'll obviously put it in our show notes, a few critical links, but how, how do you want people to find you? So I'm on Twitter and on LinkedIn. Uh, so feel free to follow uh, me on either of those platforms. Feel free to, uh, you know, message me. My DMs are open. Uh, I cannot answer every single DM, but I try. Uh, so I uh, would love to continue this dialogue. Well, thank you for joining. And, uh, and, and we are more than excited to have you back for a future episode. Thanks for having me, Nikhil. This was a blast. 